Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Elon Pape's The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which for those of you who are following the news, I am not one of those people, but for those of you who are following the news, this is probably a pretty timely book review. I didn't intend it as such. It was part of my travel through through reading series that I've been doing, recalling the travels that I did this last summer. I was in Israel in uh, the summer and I had a chance to go to Palestine, uh, it, both the West Bank and not into Gaza, but just the area around Gaza. And I had a chance to speak to some Palestinians there and spoke to Palestinians in, in Bethlehem. So I was reading this book while traveling. I, I didn't finish it until I got home, but I was, let's say, halfway through. So I was already, I was already having some learning, some, some difficult facts that I already knew some part of before, but not in the deep level that Pape goes into. Pape, who, by the way, is an Israeli Jew, and perhaps that gives the the legitimacy to write this, right? Because if anyone other than a Jew were to write this book, it would be labeled anti-Semitic. As it is, because he's Jewish, he's labeled as self-loathing, right? A, a sort of self-hating, self-loathing Jew. But all he's doing is bringing together facts. And for those who don't know, in 1948, there was an ethnic cleansing operation done in Palestine, what people would refer to as the Greater Israel Area, in which families were blown up in their beds, murdered, people were raped, men were rounded up and shot, dug, put into mass graves. And for whatever reason, I, I can give one good reason, Pape points out one of, one of these reasons in the book, that three years after the, the the claim of the Holocaust, people couldn't bring themselves to to point any fingers at the Jews, because at this time, the 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 Holocaust narrative was was first was first uh, entering the scene, you could say, and so there were there were some news stories, and Pape Pape documents some of these news stories in here in the New York Times and some other places, but then the news stories just went away. Now, the reality is that the, the ethnic cleansing occurred and has never been dealt with. And one of the fundamental understandings that I came to this summer, not only from visiting this area, but from reading the book, is that the Israelis never had a plan for what to do if they took over the land and the Arabs didn't leave. The idea was always that the Arabs were going to leave. They, they had had their homes terrorized, bombed, and the Israelis ironically seem to have missed the fact that people are willing to fight for their homes. People are willing to fight for the places that their family had lived for centuries. One of the Palestinian Christians that I met in Bethlehem, his family's lived in Palestine for 700 years. So you don't just scare people off by bombing their house. That might work on somebody who's only been around for 5, 10, 15 years. But when somebody has been around for six, 700 years, they're going to fight. And running into some Palestinians in Jordan, when I had a chance to visit, I found out that some of these families, they keep the key to their house. Even though those houses may have been bulldozed and forests have been planted over it, the idea that one day we will return to our own home that we were kicked out of. And, and the narrative that is given out in Israel is that these people ran away not realizing they ran away from people brandishing uh, bayonets, guns, bombs. And this is not any sort of conspiracy theory. You can find on the internet clips of Israeli soldiers talking about this. There's been novels written by Israeli soldiers talking about the trauma that they went through in so inhumanely murdering men, women, children, uh, helplessly, people who were not armed, people who were sleeping, whatever it might be. I read this with a couple of friends as well, and they were shocked to find out, just as I did, this part of history, which we're not taught, we're not taught because it's not popular to talk about. But this was recently brought up by President Putin in his comments on what's been going on, that at the time of the establishment of the, of the Israeli state, the UN mandate had said that another state would be established, the state of Palestine. The idea that millions of Arabs would live under the occupation of the Israelis for the rest of their for the rest of their lives and for the rest of eternity is absurd on its face. What is clear is that 
the Israelis had no plan for how to administrate this area if the Arabs didn't leave. The plan was always for the Arabs to leave. And if you want, if you want to get any further context on this, I, when I visited Hebron, had the great privilege of not only meeting with Palestinians there, but meeting with the head of settlements for, uh, for the Jews in, in Hebron. And this was his quote. I was, I was so shocked when I heard it, I wasn't able to answer, ask a follow-up question. But his response to the Arab question was, they have, I don't remember he named a number like 15, 16. They have 16 other countries, 22 other countries they can go to. We only have one. Effectively implying that they can leave. That the solution to this problem in Israel and Palestine is for the Arabs to leave. The Arabs, by the way, who've lived there for centuries, some might say millennia. And the, the Jews mostly left. There were some Jews living in there, but they were the overwhelming minority. Um, and the, the injustice of the situation comes through very clearly. And I, I don't think poetic justice could be done any more than having this be written by a Jewish professor, one who has been obviously blackballed within his own country. Uh, he, even in the beginning of the book, he apologizes to his children, you know, that I'm sorry that your father didn't choose something else to write about, but this is something that, that burns within him. So I would say within the context of this book and in relation to however the situation will progress by the time that you have a chance to watch this video, I would point out three things that cannot be disputed by either side. Firstly, the UN mandate for the creation of whatever states would come from the British, the British mandate at a time, post Sykes-Picot, post, post World War II, was that there were to be two states. This has never been withdrawn. It has never been withdrawn. So anyone who says that there is to be no Palestine, they have to do it in contravention of international law and ruling. So there has to be a state of Palestine that was agreed at the beginning. What has happened since then is an aggressive Israeli expansion into areas that were not part of the original agreement, which includes people who never signed up to fight in the war. The fact that other countries came and invaded attacking Israel and it managed to touch other people's homes did not make the people living in those homes parties to the war. So the idea that their homes can be taken because someone invaded through that way and then the Israeli army came back through there. The Israeli army doesn't get to keep other people's lands just because a war happened through there. That's, again, in contravention of international law. The current occupation, the Israelis take water from the Palestinians. All of these things are documented. The thing is, the narrative in the United States is that the Israelis, the only nuclear-armed power in the region, the only one... Uh, with advanced weapons uh, on the scale that they do. They're the poor ones that have to defend themselves. And everyone else, they're the horrible aggressors that are about to crush Israel. The narrative is simply not true. And I think what's interesting now, finally, is in this most recent exchange, most recent time of violence, we're seeing more and more people wake up to the fact that there is a problem here, that Israel cannot be considered the only... Uh, say, the, the innocent party in this situation. And the reason people are confused as to why this is the case is because they don't know the history. They don't know what happened. And these are the people who are willing to accept opinions and, and so-called facts from the news. These are people who are going to take without question that Hamas uh, um, <laughs> cut off the heads of a bunch of babies. These are the same people who believe that Saddam killed a bunch of babies in incubators, no questions, or who would believe that Assad would gas his own people three or four days after the U.S. announces it's leaving. So if you look at those three pieces of propaganda, they, they help fuel the reaction. And so all I'm asking, if people want, let me take a step back. Firstly, you don't have to have an opinion on this situation. What you can say is, I don't know enough, and take the time to do some reading. And this isn't the only reading I'm asking you to do. I'm just saying this is a start. And he has a bunch of other books that you can go in to read further. As I say, some that reference novels written by Israeli soldiers, others that are written by other people who, like him, are academics who are trying to look at the situation uh, more, more cold-bloodedly, more objectively. 
So I would encourage you, and I'm going to be, because of the situation now, my next couple of reviews will also be talking about uh, books around this region. But I wanted to start with this one because this will allow you to begin, not necessarily to have a take, but it will allow you to understand the context for the situation. But I would warn people away from having to take. No, nothing obliges you to have a so-called take on every situation that happens in the world. What's important is that if you are interested in a situation, to take a look at it, talk to people. Um, I remember some of the conversations I had with IDF soldiers in Jerusalem, talking to them. I said about how the Palestinians view things, and they just they they couldn't couldn't process what I was saying. <laughs> and even one of their superiors came out and just told, us, "Don't don't don't." Don't keep talking to me as if I was like some propagandist from Hamas, but I was simply asking questions and the IDF forces very much see themselves as the good guys and that they're, you know, there's nothing that they could have done better. So if you'd like to learn more, there'll be a link to click and buy this book below. Obviously, as always, if you found this video to be helpful or informative, hit like, hit subscribe, forward it to people. If you want to support my work and other videos like this, please uh, look at the Patreon. You can click there and support that as well. And also, I recently added an Amazon wish list. If there's a book that you'd like to see covered in the future, browse through there, click it, purchase it, and it'll get sent to me, and I'll be forced to review it possibly. No, no, no promises, but uh, let's just say it will move to the, the head of the line. Until next time, as always, enjoy your reading.